All right, I think uh, most of our participants have joined. So welcome everybody to the Berkman Klein Center's Tuesday virtual uh, conversation series. We're so pleased to have um, so many folks join us, especially online in these times. Um, and we're so pleased to welcome today, Sandra Wachter, who I will introduce in a moment. Before that, however, um, let me just go through uh, the order of what, how we hope to do the call today and just some housekeeping items so that we can make this uh, really engaging, dynamic, active uh, conversation. Um, so uh, first we'll go through the housekeeping items and um, uh, on that piece, Ruben, do you wanna pull up the slide that you have for the housekeeping? Oh, I think we may have lost Ruben. We'll do that without him for right now. Um, so on the housekeeping items, uh, please note that attendee audio and video have all been turned off for this conversation. Um, for question and answers, we would like to invite you to use the Q&A function that's found either at the uh, bottom of your web application under Q&A, or if you're in the app, also on the bottom bar. Um, I will be monitoring that tool along with a number of our other team members. Um, and then during the Q&A, I will translate um, those to, to Sandra. Um, once Sandra is done with her main presentation, we're going to have uh, two folks from the Berkman Klein Center community offer brief responses. Um, though, though that will include Berkman Fellow Bao Bao Zhang and Berkman Faculty Associate Jasmine McNeely. Um, and so once they've had the chance to respond and ask a question, we'll move to the, the broader Q&A. Um, we ask you to uh, absolutely submit and invite questions. Sandra will go through her presentation. So if there are any clarification questions, we won't be addressing them midstream, but we'll save them for the end of the, for the, end of the talk. Um, if you uh, have any technical issues throughout, please be sure to message the hosts. So you can do that again through that bottom bar. Uh, we'll be monitoring that if you have any, again, technical issues or if there's a question that you'd like to submit that um, uh, is, is not in the Q&A forum. Um, the meeting will be recorded and posted to our website after a couple of days. So please note that we are recording. Um, and then finally on, on housekeeping, the webinar had about 700 people registered, so please forgive us in advance if we're unable to get to your question or if other hiccups arise. Um, we're so pleased that so many people have joined and clearly speaks to the, to the great work Sandra has been doing and to the topic at hand. Um, our team also has moderation functions, uh, and if there's any sort of Zoom bombing or issues that come up, they will exercise those moderation functions. Um, and yes, to the person that just asked a question, please try to use the Q&A function um, for questions just because we can we can um, address what's been answered uh, and, and filter those up. There's also a nice uh, thumbs up feature in there if, if you have a question that's already been asked but you want to bump it to the top. Um, so why don't I move to introducing Sandra now? So uh, we are so pleased to have Sandra Wachter join us today. She is an associate professor and senior research fellow in law and the ethics of AI, big data, and robotics at the Oxford Internet Institute. She is also this semester, um, now virtually, a visiting faculty member at the Harvard Law School, teaching, I think, about three classes and doing a lot of work on AI and the right uh, to reasonable algorithmic inference. Her work spans so many different topic areas within the space of AI governance and AI policy, everything from the governance and ethical design of algorithms um, to open standards to opening, up big, uh, to opening up the AI black box, as well as enhancing algorithmic accountability, transparency, transparency, and explainability. She works on auditing methods for AI, and she's also working to combat bias and discrimination, and we'll talk more today uh, about fairness. Much of this work is also connected to uh, work that's been happening at the Brooklyn Klein Center on um, uh, AI governance issues and other issues of the ethics and governance of AI. We um, have recently started a project called the um, AI Policy Practice that relates very much to the work, the work that she'll be talking about today in translating many of the ethical principles and principle statements that we've heard about from multiple sectors into practice and what this means in practice. Um, and Sandra's work is really exemplary of that. So we're really pleased to have her um, and I'm gonna turn it over to her now um, to take over. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for the introduction. Can you hear me all okay? That fine? Yep, we can hear you okay. Fantastic. Um, yes, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to um, talk to you about my, my latest work. Um, 
I I'm incredibly excited to see that so many of you actually found the time to to join the talk today. Um, I know a lot of things are going on and other things are on your mind, so this is greatly appreciated. And it's actually the first time that I'm going to be talking about my latest work, so I I hope it's going to be um, interesting to you. Um, so let's just start. Um, I am going to try to share my slides. Hopefully, um, everything will work out now. Um, let's see. I hope that you are seeing my slides now. Yep, we can see them. Fantastic. Okay. I'm just going to... Fantastic. Okay, so yes, this is the, the topic, um, the title of my talk, uh, Why Fairness Cannot Be Automated, um, Bridging the Gap Between Human Discrimination Law and AI. And as I said, this is the, the latest work that I have co-written with two of my wonderful co-authors, Brent Middlestadt, who is an ethicist at the University of Oxford, and Chris Russell, a computer scientist at the University of Surrey. Um, and we have worked together in the past trying to open up the AI black box. And our current project is to look at ways to make um, AI um, fairer and um, less biased. If you're interested in that paper, it is publicly available on SSRM. Um, so I'm gonna, gonna roughly talk about like 30 minutes on, on the paper. So if you wanna have a deep dive into the topic, um, please go ahead and, and, and take a look. And I'm very excited to receive any comments um, that you might have. Um, yes, just a brief overview of the things that I would like to discuss with you today um, and hopefully have a nice discussion afterwards is the three sections that I want to address. The first is I will be talking about the parts of fairness that cannot, of AI fairness that can and cannot and should not be automated. Um, then in the second section, I'm going to contradict, my, contradict myself and talk about the aspects of fairness that should be automated. And in the third section, I'm going to talk about how we can square that cycle. Um, but yeah, before we actually start with that, I just want to give you a couple of examples on why um, I think we all should care about AI and fairness. I think most of you will already be very familiar with that topic. Um, you can hardly open the newspaper without reading anything on, uh, with, without reading something on that topic. But just to, to tell you why I particularly care about this, um, here are a couple of things. Um, one of the examples is that, for example, if you're using AI, what that could mean is that if you're a woman, it could be lethal for you. Um, an interesting piece that was published um, this year in 2020 that relates to a health app, a health app that is being used to diagnose patients and to give recommendations. And one of the recommendations of that health app is um, yeah, you being diagnosed and then something is recommended to you. Um, one of the problems that we see is that uh, with health diseases in general, this has, has been traditionally seen as a male disease. Um, what does that mean? It means that the online apps that we currently have mainly run on data that is collected from men. So they work very well for men, but they are not really good for a female. For female users, so what that means if a female user is then reporting, for example, having pain in her left arm or in her back, it could mean that the app is diagnosing this as a depression rather than a heart attack and is just recommending that the person is seeing a doctor in a couple of days, which could then be too late and actually quite detrimental for their life. Another example is that um, if AI is being used, it could mean that people of color are assumed to be criminals. A very interesting study that was conducted by the Civil Liberties Group in 2018, where they used um, Amazon's facial recognition software to compare the pictures of federal lawmaker, lawmakers against the database of publicly available pictures of mugshots, basically. And they used the Amazon technology um, to match those pictures against each other. And what happened is that 28 lawmakers were um, labeled as um, 
criminals. The interesting part is that the software that's being used misidentified African American and Latino members of Congress at a much higher rate than white people. And keep in mind that software is actually being used by police departments and other organizations. The last example that I want to focus on is that if I, if I is being used, what that could mean is that being gay is being equated with being a sex offender. Interesting um, article in The Atlantic in 2011 showed that if you downloaded Grindr, this could happen. So Grindr is a dating app like Tinder for um, gay people. And if you download that app, what could happen is that it also recommends you related or relevant applications. And one of those relevant and um, related applications is the sex offender search app. So that would help you to figure out if sex offenders are living near your neighborhood, which would help you to be uh, to protect you and your family. So those are just three um, examples that show why we actually need to care about AI and bias and fairness and why this is such an important field. So let's start with the first part that talks about uh, why AI fairness, unfortunately, cannot and actually should not be automated. After all of that backlash, what of course happens is that you know the tech community got worried about that and started asking very fair questions in the sense that yeah look, okay let's talk about what we can do to improve that situation so the first question that um a computer scientist asked the lawyer is well what is fairness tell me what fairness means and the lawyer would say well fairness we don't even have that concept i, I can't tell you anything about that we have something that is non-discrimination law, which is probably the closest thing that you're looking for. Then the chemical scientist would ask, okay, well then tell me what discrimination means. And the lawyer would say, well, it depends. And the problem is it depends on a lot of things. And I want to walk you through all the things that it depends on and show you how contextual it is and how hard it is, how hard it is to automate something like fairness or, or bias or discrimination. Just a very quick overview of how non-discrimination works in the European Union. Uh, typically, we have two types of discrimination that we want to prevent. We have direct discrimination and indirect discrimination. Direct discrimination means that you are being treated less favorable based on a protected attribute. Um, for example, that could be, I'm not giving you the job because you're a woman, direct discrimination, which will be illegal in most cases. Um, less likely to happen, obviously, um, because nobody will uh, admit to that fact. More interesting is the idea of indirect discrimination. So that means that the seemingly neutral provision criteria of practice that is applied to everybody um, poses a particular disadvantage for a protected group when compared with other people. That sounds very abstract. What that would mean, for example, is um, if I told you that I'm only hiring people that have short hair. You know that hair is not the same as gender. Therefore, it's not direct discrimination. You're not using gender to discriminate against people, but you will understand that it could have a significant effect on women because on average, they have longer hair. So that's the idea of direct, indirect discrimination. Um, the second thing I just wanna to briefly touch on is that the scope of non-discrimination law is quite scattered. Um, in general, we have three different um, groups that we are protecting. We have the group of ethnicity, we have the group of gender, and we have the third group consisting of religion, belief, disability, age, and sexual orientation. And depending on what group you're looking at, the scope of protection will be very different. So we have the most protection when it comes to ethnicity, we have the least protection when it comes to religion, belief, disability, age, and sexual orientation. That is all a bit complicated, I know, and I don't have to remember that. I think the easiest thing is just to show how those concepts translate into practice and how hard it is to apply those concepts in a, in a meaningful way. So let's just take a toy example here. Let's just say um, there's an interesting job advertisement that you see. Um, somebody's looking for a chef in a restaurant. Very fancy, fantastic job in a fancy restaurant, um, dream job. The only caveat is that it says in the job advertisement that you are required to eat pork. So if you hear that, 
the immediate thing is that your gut will tell you, well, there could potentially be discriminatory effects for particular groups. What could happen is that you could say, well, um, it could potentially be direct discrimination. If you think about, for example, a Jewish community um, that cannot or don't, are not eating pork, this could be directly affecting them. So you could say that, you know, um, it's so close to Jewish tradition and to Jewish culture um, that saying that you need to eat pork could be direct discrimination against Jewish people. Or you could say, well, it could be, it's actually not that close to Judaism, but it could be potentially indirect discrimination. It's a neutral provision. Everybody has to eat pork. It applies to everybody equally. Um, but you are having a hunch that it will disadvantage Jewish people more than others because they cannot eat pork. So the question is, is it direct or indirect discrimination? And the answer is, it depends. It depends. Um, it depends on the context. It depends on the case. It depends on the member state. It depends on the courts. So there is no right or wrong answer just by using that toy example. However, let's just go with indirect discrimination because that is the type of discrimination that is more likely to happen when we talk about AI systems. The second thing that you need to um, take into consideration when you're bringing a claim is um, proof. Um, the idea here is important that your non-discrimination law is based on the idea of contextual equality. So that's a term that we coin in, in the paper, which tries to describe the essence and the nature of non-discrimination law. Um, what does it mean? Contextual equality means that it is based on the idea of comparison and context. There is no such thing as fairness as a standalone light, right? Fairness is always something that only exists in comparison. You are being treated worse than somebody else. Therefore, comparison, whether or not this discrepancy, um, this disparity is justified will depend on the context. Therefore, contextual equality. Those three concepts, again, are highly contextual. One thing you need to show that you are suffered as advantage and you need to find a comparator. So let's go through those um, three key requirements using our example from the restaurant. Okay. So we are claiming that having that job requirement, having to eat pork, could actually be problematic um, for people of Jewish faith. So in order to be protected under the discrimination law, you need to claim that you're part of a protected group. And here's the first hurdle. Judaism, does that fall under the protection of ethnicity or religious beliefs? Um, that might sound odd, but that is exactly one of the biggest things that you need to take into consideration, that the definition of ethnicity and religious beliefs are highly contextual and regulated in the member states. Some of the member states think that Judaism is actually ethnicity. Others think that Judaism is religious beliefs. And this is important because, as I told you, depending on which group you're looking at, Different levels and different standards of protection will apply. In general, religious belief is less protected than ethnicity, so it does play a role. But this is not the only example. Those um, different types of protection, you will find that in different contexts as well. For example, transgender. Some member states that some member states say that um, transgender falls under sexual orientation, where other member states say it actually falls under sex discrimination. Again, it has different legal consequences. Um, some member states think that Scientology is a religion. Others don't think so. It is not really clear how you define ethnicity. Either some people say um, just using the word black is something that refers to ethnicity. Others say that is not what constitutes an ethnicity. Um, and lastly, disability. Some people say, for example, obesity is a disability. Others say no. So you already start to struggle to figure out what the scope is of the protected group that you're trying to put yourself under. And it's highly contextual and will depend on the member states. The next problem is that let's just say you settled on, let's say, it is freedom of religion. The next point that you need to show is that your group um, is suffering a particular disadvantage. That means you need to show the nature, the severity, and the significance of the harm. Again, all three concepts, highly contextual, super hard to automate. 
The first has to do with the harm. First question, what is the harm? How do you define harm? Does it need to be a concrete or an abstract harm? Depends, again. Concrete harm, does that mean that I need to prove that actually less Jewish people applied for the job because they felt they're not gonna be um, invited to interview anyway? Or is an abstract danger of them being deterred enough to be a particular disadvantage? Second question, severity. Is having one specific job requirement and job act big enough, severe enough um, to warrant protection under the law? What if the other job requirements are actually something that everybody could fulfill? Is it still discriminatory? Last question, significant. It should not just be a short-term um, phenomena. It has to be something that is significant. What does that mean? What if you only, you know, the ephemeral nature of online advertisement, is that enough of a significant impact on you if it's just short-lived and maybe next week you see different jobs that you haven't seen before? And lastly, how many people do need to be affected for, eat, for, for them to be significantly disadvantaged. As I said, having a pork eating requirement in a job advertisement, the assumption is that it will put Jewish community at much more disadvantage than others. But how much, how much more do they need to be disadvantaged than others? And again, it depends. The court came up with words like significant more, a far greater number than more than, considerably larger percentage than. No clear cut um, requirements around that. Very flexible, very context depending, um, something that is very hard to automate. But what's interesting when you look at, at the comparison, it has to, um, at the comparison side is that it has to affect a larger number than others. So that means it's interesting to look at the comparator, right? And that is the second part of, of, of the composition part. So the question is, who are you comparing yourself to? Because somebody else needs to get an advantage, whereas you are being disadvantaged. To figure out who is actually having an advantage, you need to look at the reach of the contested rule, and you need to find a comparator that is in a similar situation. So the first thing is, what is the, root, the, the reach of the contested rule? Again, sounds very abstract, but makes a lot of sense. Um, the contested rule can be many things. You could uh, you can contest the rule as legislation. You could contest a contractual agreement. You could contest a regional law. You could collect, uh, contest a collective agreement. You could um, contest hiring practices. And depending on what the rule is that you are uh, contesting, that the makes your population. So if you're fighting against legislation of member states, that means all, for example, um, Germans, for example, would be affected. A German law will affect everybody in Germany. Whereas, for example, a German regional law will only, for example, will only affect people in Bavaria. If you have a contextual agreement, then it will only affect you and the people in your, in your company. So again, it depends what is the rule that you're contesting and who is actually affected by it. Well, that makes a lot of sense in, in that context, but it gets very, very hard when you then apply it to online advertisement or for digital technologies in general. For example, what is the reach of online ads? What is the reach of Google? Who is affected by Google? You could make an argument and say, well, Google is global. Therefore, everybody on the world is affected. Therefore, you should use global statistics, no questions asked. You could also make the argument and say, well, actually, I'm not trying to target everybody on the planet. I'm only trying to target a specific region. So that's my actual reach. You could also make the argument and say, well, everybody who sees the job advertisement is affected by that rule. Or you could say everybody who applied for that job. Or you could say only people that were qualified for that job are affected by the rule. Or only people that were invited to an interview were actually only the people that were offered the position. You could also say, I don't think that Google is actually responsible for the rules. It's the employer who sets those rules, the rules of you have to eat pork at work. Again, there is no clear cut answer. It depends. Once you have figured out the global rule, the other thing that you need to find is 
somebody, as I said, that is treated better than you. And that can be a quite um, important task. What you need to prove is that other people are being treated better than you. And the only difference between you and them is your religion. So that means the pool of people who actually can live with the port each rule is much greater. So we identify the Jewish community as potentially um, disadvantaged. But if you think very closely, it could also affect the Muslim community. Well, the question now is, if it's Muslim, the Muslim, the Jewish community, is either of those actually significantly affected? I don't know. And what about vegans, for example, right? Vegans or vegetarians. There are discussions around whether vegan, veganism and vegetarianism is seen as a belief, an ethical belief. So that could mean that your pool of people that you thought that actually have an advantage is getting smaller and smaller because actually it's a lot of people that are being affected by that rule. It's the Muslim community, it's the Jewish community, it's vegetarians and it's vegans. So again, who are you comparing yourself to? Which again, backs a further question of, do you, you know, do you need to find an abstract comparison? Do you need to find a concrete comparator? The law said, the jurisprudence says, it depends. Sometimes the court says, yes, you have to find somebody concrete. Sometimes they say it's absolutely okay to be abstract. The question is, what if actually everybody suffers and nobody's treated better. You have a rule that disadvantages everybody. Is that fair? Open question. What if you cannot find somebody that is treated better than you are? Does that make the treatment that you receive okay? What if you don't know who your counterpart would be and you don't know how you would you compare yourself to? Again, depends if the, if the case falls through. Very, very contextual um, important questions that are very hard to answer. So just to sum up this chapter, um, yes, as I said, uh, non-discrimination law is about contextual equality. There are no consistent standards of fairness um, in the European Union. The courts and the national member states define this on a case-to-case -case basis, very often with intuitive measures um, and intuitive tests. All the key concepts, who is affected, how much do you need to be affected, who else is treated better than you, are highly contextual and depend on the, on the facts of the case and very often on member state law. And whether or not um, statistics or other evidence can be used, again, is being assessed on a case-to-case -case basis. The question of whether or not the evidence is reliable, significant, um, or relevant will depend on member state law or the, or the court of justice. So we have a lot of fragmented Senate across um, the union. Another thing to keep in mind is that actually the courts are not very keen on using statistics altogether. They're actually quite conservative when it comes to that. Um, one of the reasons is because the courts think that it could lead to a battle of number. You could lie with statistics. It could also mean that maybe only one party has the resources to find those statistics and you want to um, make sure that there's equality of weapons or the statistics simple, simply don't exist because they are very sensitive. So information on sexuality, for example, is something we usually don't keep that much statistics on because it could be privacy invasive. So that means that actually, um, yeah, we don't have that much um, the, the case law doesn't actually like statistics that much. But the most important thing to take away is that youth non discrimination law is based on contextual equality, no consistent standards. And even though that is very, very hard to automate, some would even say it's impossible to automate, it's quite important to keep in mind that this is a feature, not a bug. This is by design. This is how the law was designed. In order to create and establish fairness, you need to be flexible and contextual. So that is something um, just as, the, um, as, as one of the takeaways. Now, after I just told you that I don't think that we can automate fairness, and in fact that we should automate fairness, let me give a couple of minutes to contradict myself by saying there are parts of fairness that should absolutely be automated. It's very keen that we do that. Coming back to contextual equality, as I said, the assessment of fairness is very often rely 
reliant on intuition. That makes a lot of sense. You use common knowledge, you use obvious facts and convictions. That's what judges do. That is fine, and it makes sense because it's centered around real-life cases that deal with actual social inequality that are obvious in our world. A couple of examples. If I told you, right, that I'm banning headscarves um, as an employer, you would immediately know that this could have an impact on religious freedom. I don't need to give you a lot of numbers or statistics. Your social gut will immediately tell you that something is off. In a similar way, if I told you that only married couples are going to get social benefits, you will immediately say, well, this will have a disproportionate effect for same-sex couples. And again, I don't need to show you that much data. It will be immediately apparent to you. Last example, um, by the way, actual cases, all actual cases. If I have, as I said, the requirement that says I'm only, I'm not hiring people with long hair, you will immediately know this puts women at a disadvantage. But this is in a world where humans discriminate against humans. We are now entering a world where algorithms are the discriminators and they are quite different than humans when they discriminate. Because when um, compared to traditional forms of, of discrimination, AI is much more abstract, um, in, unintuitive, subtle, intangible, and difficult to detect. And that is changing all the legal tools that we have available to investigate, to prevent, and to punish discrimination. Our discrimination law is based on the idea that the perpetrator is a human, not an algorithm. So what does that mean? Simply, the, the tools that we have at our disposal to challenge discrimination for a claimant. What is the first thing that needs to happen before bringing a claim? You would need to feel discriminated. For example, somebody tells you I'm not hiring you because you're a woman. That's direct discrimination. You feel the disadvantage. You can bring a claim. The other thing that could happen that the environment is so toxic that there is no direct discrimination, but it indirectly disadvantages women, and you can bring a claim based on discrimination or harassment. Point being is, you see, you feel that others are being treated better than you are. You see other people getting hired or promoted, and you are, you are losing out. In a traditional world, um, what I would need to do to go back to our job advertisement example is that if I wanted to exclude you from seeing the job that I'm hiring a chef in my restaurant, what I need to do, what I would need to do is actually go to your newspaper and cut it out. So you wouldn't see that a job advertisement is there. Obviously, nobody can do that. The other thing is that you might say um, you see a job advertisement and it says that it has that requirement and immediately thought, oh, this could be a problem and you raise a claim. Now we do have algorithms that do the dirty work for us. Um, they're not actually going through that effort. They are just inferring that you might be a person that is um, not eating pork. They might infer that you're Jewish. They might infer that you're Muslim. They might infer that you're vegetarian or a vegan and then just filter you out. And then when you're browsing for new jobs, the only thing that you find is an empty page. That is the main problem. You don't know and you don't feel that you have been filtered out. The feeling of injustice is something that you don't necessarily feel anymore. The main reason why people start complaining and, and launching claims. This is just for job advertisement, but that is actually a general problem that we have with big data. It's not just jobs. Everything is being tailored to you. It's the search results on Google or Bing. It's the tweets on Twitter. It's the posts on Facebook. It's the prices that you see on Amazon. Everything is tailored and curated, and you don't know what you don't see. So in reality, what happens is that you look at something like that. You have blinders, and you are not aware that you might be disadvantaged, and that's quite important. That's a big, big disadvantage to traditional discrimination. But it's not just the complaining sites that are being challenged, it's also the judiciary. Um, because again, to come back, with, compared with traditional forms of discrimination, it is more in, uh, less intuitive, subtle, and intangible. And that means that judges cannot necessarily rely on their intuition anymore. That in, unintuitive biased 
data could cause problems and that new groups might emerge that are being um, mistreated and where a law doesn't offer protection. To give you an example, so this is Fia. This is my brother's um, puppy. He just adopted a couple of, 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 of weeks back. That's the latest member um, of, of our family. Um, let's just use another toy example and say that an algorithm finds a very interesting correlation between um, being a dog owner and being a great chef. So what could that mean? Um, let's just say the story behind it is just, I don't know, people that have dogs are more playful and therefore they're more likely to come up with exciting dishes. So you see an interesting correlation between dog ownership and being a fantastic chef. It might be a bit of an odd job requirement to use dog ownership, but it's not necessarily something that immediately makes you alarm, being uh, alarm bells ring, right? Not in the same way as, let's say, um, long hair, uh, a headscarf, eating pork. It might be odd, but it's intuitively okay. So you use dog ownership as a proxy for being a great chef. The thing that you don't know is that you using that data and unintentionally discriminating against protected groups. For example, um, why I'm using this example is because it's a very painful personal story that for years now I've been trying to get a dog and I live in the UK. And it's almost impossible for me to get a dog, mainly because I'm renting. The laws in the UK are such that if you're renting, 99% of the time the landlords will not allow you to have a dog. The only way how you can have a dog is if you own property. So without knowing that social story of the UK, you all of a sudden have dog ownership as a proxy for wealth. And a proxy for wealth is obviously always correlated with gender and ethnicity. So you use an unintuitive group that doesn't make your alarm bells ring, but you start discriminating against people without knowing it. The other thing that could happen with the dog ownership example is that there is no correlation, for example, between um, uh, a protected group. But by using dog ownership as something that determines whether you should get a loan, whether you should get hired, whether you should get fired, whether you have to go to prison, you are creating a new stigmatized group that is not accounted for in non-discrimination law. Obviously, dog ownership, having a dog, liking dogs is not something that the law protects, but it could in the future become a new group um, that is being stigmatized. So therefore, intuition is also challenged in, in, in that regard. Okay, how do we square that cycle? How can we make things better? Well, the first thing is, I think it's a lot of learning exercises that we have to do and writing that paper has definitely been one of those things for, for me. I think it's very important for the tech community to embrace the idea of contextual equality. Society and humans are more than zeros and ones and it is almost impossible to code fairness and it's probably a good thing because contextuality is something that makes fairness work. At the same time, the legal community actually needs to learn from technologists a bit more and embrace some of their coherent and consistent approaches when measuring disparity. As I said, intuition will be less important in the future if data-driven decisions are being what we're going with. So what we need to do is work together to find a way of consistently assess um, bias, but have no consistent interpretation. So that means come up with a statistical test that allows you to assess whether something happened without taking away the agility that the judiciary actually needs. So we have been talking about what kind of tests we should actually use or suggest um, to, to bring, that, that bring those two disciplines together. And we looked at uh, the statistical test that the finance community is, is developing. It's very hard to map it to what the case law wants, because as I said, the case law is very incoherent and inconsistent. Um, so it's not quite easy to find something there. Two types of tests that are somehow semi-related to what the court has been doing in the past are negative dominance and demographic disparity. However, both of those tests are actually quite problematic when it comes to um, data-driven decision. So, as I said, um, 
the idea of indirect discrimination is that one particular group has to be more significantly affected um, than others. So, for example, you know, the Jewish community being affected by a pork eating requirement in, in the job advertisement. Negative dominance is kind of looking at that. It is looking at the disadvantaged group and is figuring out if one protected group, let's say Jewish community, makes up the majority of that group. And if that's the case, um, then it will be flagged as potentially discriminatory. So the problem here is, though, that even though that test makes a lot of sense in the world without algorithms because you have that social narrative that immediately tells you that something iffy is going on. It might actually be very problematic if you scale that up for the protection of minority and intersectional um, discrimination. Because if you look at, for example, uh, minorities, it would be very hard for them to actually um, jump over the 50% mark and it wouldn't be flagged up as discriminatory. In the same way for intersectional discrimination. Or you could also do something what we coined as divide and conquer. You just come up with a reason to create groups and subgroups, for example, black women, white women, Asian women, and neither of those groups actually jump over the 50% um, mark. But in total together, they would be um, over the 50% mark. So strategic grouping could make it look like that not that non-discriminatory things are going on when it's actually quite biased. So that is not a good test to use um, uh, for a judiciary. The other thing that is close to what the judiciary is doing is um, demographic disparity. That's a bit that's that's smarter in the sense that it looks at specific groups that you're interested in. For example, it looks at ethnicity, looks at African American, Asian, white people, and compares how many of those are being rejected and accepted, and they try to figure out if they are rejected and accepted equal rates. Why is that the most um, closest, one of the closer things that the Court of Justice wants? Because in an interesting case from the 70s, um, which is called Seymour Smith, the Court of Justice actually um, advocated for that type of comparison. Interesting case, sex discrimination case from the 70s, where there was a requirement um, that said only people that have been working at a company for longer than two years get protection for unfair dismissal. This rule, this law was being contested with the assumption that on average it will affect women more than men because they often take career breaks to take care of their children. Therefore, meeting the requirements of those two years um, could be problematic for them. And they brought statistics from the general workforce. And the court said the best way to read statistics is to look at the men and the women and look how many of the men and the women can satisfy this requirement and how many can't and compare those. This is the gold standard that was first established in the 70s and in uh, other cases in, in, in in the previous, in the following years as well. But the problem again is that the court does not follow its own advice. Quite ironically, in that very Seymour Smith case where the court came up with that gold standard, in the end, it didn't follow through with that and use a different measure. So again, there is a lot of um, discoherence in, in the case law. The only problem with um, conditional um, disparity is that it could be um, a little bit noisy um, in the sense that it could flag up too many uh, false positives. And a very um, uh, well-known statistics examples, again, from the 70s that showed that something that looks biased can at certain look, but at second look actually not be biased. So um, the example was from the Berkeley admissions uh, where more men applied than women and 44% of the men were admitted to Berkeley, whereas only 45% of the women were admitted to the university, to the whole university. And that gave the immediate rise that there is some um, gender disparity going on. Um, it could be potentially discriminatory. However, when you then condition the for conditional demographic disparity, um, if you condition on the actual department, what you will find is quite interesting. Um, you will see that women have, in general, uh, applied to more competitive departments, um, such as English, and therefore there were more rejections for women. But if you looked at the departments in itself, what you will see that actually for all departments, women were admitted at higher rates 
than men. And actually their admission processes was biased against men, not women. So again, this can show that sometimes statistical tests can be a bit noisy. Therefore, if you use um, conditional demographic parity, which just differs in the way that you add one or more additional conditions when you look at your groups, you could actually get a less noisy version that shows you where potential disparity could occur. So let me sum up to say that what conditional parity does and what it doesn't do. I would like to see conditional parity to understand something akin to a treasure map. Um, it's a treasure map that shows you where to look, but not what to think. Um, the treasure map does not answer the very important contextual questions, such as, did illegal disparity occur? Was it justified? What's the scope of a protected group? Um, what's my comparator? Was the damage severe enough to warrant a claim? All of those things are contextual. All those things are reserved for the judiciary and is not something that can be automated. The thing that conditional um, demographic parity does is it's removing the blinders of intuition. With all the examples that I showed you, intuition will be less important in the future. And it's just removing that and showing you where you can look. It warns you of the dangers. It shows you where to look, but it doesn't tell you uh, where to think. And this is important because humans discriminate differently than algorithms. So let me conclude just with um, three things. Um, yes, the three, three lessons that um, I, I, I have here is that we have to keep in mind that uh, AI fairness, part of it cannot and should not be automated. And this is something that computer science really needs to learn from law. Um, we are more than zeros and ones, and contextuality is a feature of not a bug. At the same time, the legal community needs to understand that if we use data-driven decisions, more coherent ways to assess bias are needed because the traditional intuition might just fail you in the future. And our idea of conditional demographic parity would allow us to bring some agility to computer science and a bit more cohesion to the law. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Sandra. This is usually the part where we clap. So I'll give you a little clap from home and hope that other folks are doing that as well. Um, so I want to go ahead and invite our two respondents to um, be unmuted, Bao Bao Zhang and Jasmine McNeely. And while they're going ahead and doing that, thank you all for all the questions you're submitting through the Q&A. I would certainly encourage you to keep, um, to keep submitting uh, through that. I know that our time extends until 1.15 if we want to go that far. And so once Bao Bao and Jasmine offer some brief responses, we'll start going through the, the questions. And they've been all, all really terrific so far. So I know Sandra can maybe take a skim as well at some point, but, uh, but I will um, translate those after uh, Bao Bao and Jasmine give their responses. So Bao Bao, now that you're on, why don't we have you go first and offer a first response? Thank you so much, Sandra, for your great presentation. I also really enjoyed reading the paper, which I recommend that uh, if you're uh, if you enjoy this presentation, I highly recommend you also read the paper that's available on SSRN. Um, so I have sort of two comments that I want to make, um, and I hope it will be useful feedback as you continue to work on this paper. Um, the first sort of comment I have is regarding conditional demographic disparity, which you talked about at the end. And one of the concerns I have with using that as a test is um, we can contest what uh, variables to condition on when you uh, when you're doing an evaluation. And as you see in a lot of social science research, economists, political scientists, sociologists, when they run a model with different types of uh, variables, conditioning on different kinds of variables, you get out very different results. And my concern is when you're, uh, when dealing with a, a court case, the two sides could, you know, then it becomes a battle of numbers, depending on what specific example there, conditioning on a variable is problematic. Um, a lot of times, when you're making causal claims, you don't want to condition on a variable that is an outcome of uh, the independent variable. For instance, 
Uh, let's consider admissions to an elite high school. Uh, this is an actual problem in, uh, in New York City where uh, to enter elite high schools, students would need to take a test. But we know that, so there's great racial disparity in admissions. Uh, so if you condition on the test score, which is a, uh, could be caused, and we know that it's caused by uh, an outcome of racial disparity, that's highly problematic. You could say, well, you know, black students don't have as high of a test score. Uh, and so, you know, they're admitted at uh, a lesser rate, then that's not really a problem. So I'm concerned that a lot of variables that you can condition on is a direct outcome of racism, of sexism, of other forms of discrimination. My second comment is on um, the idea whether it's actually easier to audit algorithmic discrimination versus ones caused by humans, whether that's uh, an individual or as part of a bureaucratic process. Um, there's some technologists who argue that if you're trying to run an audit experiment on you know, a bunch of employers advertising on Craigslist or in newspapers, that's actually a more costly field experiment to run uh, where it requires more resources than directly auditing a algorithm. And I'd just like you to uh, respond to that. Uh, I, I know this is sort of a controversial statement, but um, some social scientists have made that argument where it's harder to probe into the biases of a human mind or a collection of human minds than to probe into an algorithm. Thank you so much for your presentation and your paper. Thank you, thank you so much um, um, for for the comment. I'm, I'm very excited to hear that you um, uh, like the paper. Um, I anticipated that people will have a problem with the conditional part of it because it, again, it doesn't solve the problem that people want to solve. Um, it is also a problem that is not ours to solve probably because I think we actually have to make peace with the fact that what you condition on is something that is highly contextual, it is political, it is cultural, and it's not something that you can automate preemptively. And it's definitely something that um, developers should do. Um, so that's, it is more in favor of supporting the idea of what the law actually wants and the law wants to be agile. However, I get your point that certain types of tests, for example, test scores are extremely discriminating against groups. We know that, for example, looking at um, race and math, if you just look at those, um, on average, women will be uh, have, having worse grades than men. That's not because they're not capable of doing that, but there's a social inequality. For example, they don't have the good tutors, not being encouraged, and all of that. That's the social injustice that helps with that. What we're doing, it is not for... Um, if you have that, then you need to change the rule, right? If you see that that rule is disadvantaging people, you need to change it. The test that we are proposing is not there to figure out if the rule is good. It is showing you how it's disadvantaging certain people and whether or not you are okay with that disparity. If you say, this is just how the cookie crumbles and this is social inequality that we have to accept or whether you see this as a starting point to intervene with policy, that's something for the judiciary to do. The only thing that we want to do is try to show um, different views of how you can see it and let it be decided by a judge, if that makes sense. Whereas at the moment, I feel like you only see half, half of the truth. Um, that's what the one point. The other point, sorry, could you remind me? It was about humans being more or less biased in algorithm, sorry. Oh, um, it's about, uh, so um, econ some economists have done audit studies where they try to see if there's racism in uh, hiring and they basically send out a bunch of resumes yeah. to a bunch of employers. And that's somewhat costly to do uh, yeah. as an audit study. And they argue that if, if there's a central algorithm that you can audit, that it would, it would take less resources to audit the algorithm than to uh, 
audit a number of employers, uh, in some ways it might be easier to detect bias, to detect the mechanism of the bias and algorithm than to have to study, you know, a thousand employers and we don't really understand how the human mind works. Well, I mean, both are not independent from each other, right? The algorithm, where the algorithm finds its bias from is because people are biased. They're not creating its own biases. So I think you can see them distinct um, from each other. Um, they are connected. Like um, an algorithm doesn't like exist independent from, um, from society. Um, whether or not it's easier to audit algorithms, I mean, it's two questions. Is it technically easier? I don't know. Maybe. Is it less costlier? I don't know. Maybe. Um, the, the main problem is that it's, I think that algorithms can be used to be, um, if you don't do anything, it's going to make things worse. If you intervene, it's going to make things better. But the problem is that in order to do so, you would need to actually put resources into doing that. Algorithms are not necessarily optimizing towards fair outcomes and fairness and equality and justice. They are often optimizing towards profit. So um, you would need to put in resources to scale that back and nudge it in a, in a way. Um, so I think it will be costly probably on both sides. And... Um, I don't think you can think one independent from each other because one informs the other anyway. Well, but thank you so much for that. And um, to, the, for, to the first point that you were responding to as well, I'm seeing a lot of questions in the Q&A that relate to that. So we, we might circle back to that um, in, in more depth during the Q&A. Jasmine, may I invite you to unmute yourself and to just offer a brief, brief response or question? Sure. Um, thank you, Sandra, for uh, your presentation. I really appreciate it. Uh, you're going through um, the principles of EU non-discrimination uh, a law, and I think that's that was really important to understand, like contextually, your work and your project. I guess my my question um, deals with uh, the use of equality um, and comparison of different groups. Um, and so we say like uh, we need to find a comparator or a comparative group um, to, to think about a group discrimination or possible group discrimination. I wanted to know like if, if we want to know about equality or if we want to know about equity, because it seems like the Seymour Smith uh, case kind of goes to equity, kind of looks at history of certain groups, but also I want to know, like, how does equity um, as a contextual thing, which places groups within, like, context, context historically, like, uh, historically women in uh, admissions in certain fields perhaps have faced discrimination, or historically um, certain uh, ethnic groups were discriminated against in, in particular contexts. So like, where does e equity um, come into the picture of thinking about not just having algorithms or, or algorithmic decision making make equal or possibly equal uh, uh, decisions, but also for those same algorithms to take into account that certain groups historically or within certain contexts are you know more impacted or have been more impacted or whatever the case may be so that's part of the question but then also where does um so we're talking about like possible statistical tests for courts to use um to think about evidence where does um the qualitative come into play when thinking about these statistics that we get back and people want to use statistics because, you know, numbers, right? Um, yeah. Where does the qualitative come into play and help us interpret or help us um, refine, uh, reimagine, do something about algorithms that may be making these discriminatory uh, decisions? Thank you. I think they're both very fantastic questions and both of those questions have um, accompanied me for, for the last year or so. So I'm very grateful that I get to talk about this um, now. I think the question of equity versus equality is very, very important and very hard to answer. I think probably the, the biggest discrepancy would be between how Europeans see it and, and how um, the US sees it that I, I, again, I'm not an expert in, in U.S. non-discrimination law, 
but the idea is more about um, rectifying historical um, injustices. And that's definitely something that European non-discrimination law does as well. We have those protected groups because we have seen that um, they have been disadvantaged in the past and now we want to tilt um, the scales back to actual equality. So a lot of the cases that you have obviously will have um, claimants that are from traditional stigmatized groups. But the way that um, non-discrimination law, at least in Europe, is imagined that this is more or less a halfway stop to perfect equality, if that makes sense. A lot of the cases that we have right now are trying to rectify the, the, the problems that we had, but what we're trying to do is actually establish equality for all. Um, and there are theories around that that say that we should actually try to make things fair for everybody and try to get rid of those um, traditional groups and think about fair distribution of goods rather than trying to rectify um, those things. So this is a long process and we're actually not there yet. But you can see in the later judgments is that um, the historical component is, is becoming less and less important in, in Europe, especially in the last couple of two years where the Court of Justice has um, often, for example, also explained that the private sector has a duty to be fair. Um, much more than it used to be or like in the past didn't have at all and that the groups are fluent and that you should be able to add to those groups and you should not be refined to those groups. It's actually about something more deep like equality rather than just rectifying things. And I think that's the trajectory in Europe. Definitely in the 70s, it was about the traditional forms of gender discrimination or racial discrimination. But especially since 2008, that has been um, changing quite drastically, and I see that going um, forward in the future. And in in a way, I I want to say I completely acknowledge that traditional groups that, that certain groups have been disadvantaged and they have suffered much more than others, and that has to be acknowledged and has to be rectified. But in my dream scenario, it would also be that we end up in a, in a society where we all are equal, regardless of everything. If that makes sense. Um, and yeah, that's, that's a, a longer way to, um, to go. The second point, yes, the quality versus quantity. Very important. I don't want to say, I think, I hope it doesn't come across in the paper, or it didn't come across in the point that, is, is that I'm advocating for only using um, statistics or that statistics should be favored. Not at all. I think um, the, the rule of law of fair trial and the idea of, of quality of weapons should allow you to admit anything and we should not allow statistics to be you know, misused, especially if they're not available. The only thing is what I'm saying, if you wanted to use it, which you don't have to and you shouldn't be compelled to, here's a way how to read it that does not mislead you and that actually tells you the truth. It's more like putting the right glasses on if you so to choose to read the book, if that makes sense. Great. So thank you for those responses, Sandra. And thank you, Jasmine. Um, we have a very robust um, question and answer uh, set of questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt to just try to combine where there are um, specific topics that are similar in those questions. Um, the, the very first question at the top of the queue, I think Jasmine's response actually was getting at that, where Sasha, Sasha Kostanzichuk, um, they, they were asking just about how do we think about multiple advantage groups, like such as where black women face greater harms than um, in, in AI and automated decision-making systems than white women. Um, I want to give a shout out to Sasha's book, Design Justice, because I think that uh, a lot of those questions are, are um, addressed in, in, in that design piece, and especially with the computer scientists that you're talking about. Um, so, so I think that was maybe addressed in Jasmine's comment, but Sasha, if there's more we want to dive into, um, please just ping me. But I do want to combine that with a comment that Joy Bolomami made, which gets back to what um, Babel was talking about in this, in this concept of group fairness versus individual fairness. And I think her question dives a little bit more deeply into it um, um, because she's asking about when we're thinking about issues of harms 
viewed via the parameters of nature and severity and significance. It, it, like, how, how do we consider that? And in what, and in the instance where we're using AI, AI for triaging, where structural inequalities can lead to demographic disparities, what are the, those contextual factors that would be taken in, into account that you described? And how does this change when we're thinking about an individual versus a specific group? So again, we touched a little bit upon it with Bao Bao, but I think that's a little bit of a different lens on this uh, topic. Yes, um, thank you for, for your question. Um, unfortunately, that did not get enough presence in the presentation, but there's actually a, a section in the paper that, that tries to touch um, intersectionality a bit more in depth than I, I was able to do just now because I very much fear that this is of, of critical concern and the, the law has not found an answer yet. Um, I'm especially disappointed with European law, to be honest, because we just recently had a case where somebody tried to um, establish precedents, precedents for intersexual discrimination and failed. Um, case was um, a discrimination case where um, um, it was regarding survivors' pensions um, and yeah, of, of, of a gay couple. And the problem was that um, in order to get survivors' pensions, you would need to be, would have been married, let's say, for 20 years or so. Um, they have been um, married for 10 years, but only for 10 years because that was the first time when gay marriage was allowed in Ireland. So they were not able to actually be married as long as survivors' pension would require, but they have been together and sharing the same household for more than 30 years. So what the claimant tried to do is try to combine that and say, this is age discrimination combined with sexual orientation. And the court said, no, you can't do that. Um, even though the literature very strongly <laughs> understands that intersexual discrimination is a problem and is a thing, the court has never backed it up yet. And that is actually a problem. Um, one of the things with, with what we try to do with the paper is actually give a stronger voice to intersectionality because if you use the negative dominant thing where you need to have a 50% mark to get over, which would be the way that the judge would argue, the intersectional people would actually fall, fall through the cracks. And with contextual parity, they wouldn't. So it wouldn't matter how, how large the community actually is because you're comparing both sides, you would be able to flag that up if you're looking at intersectional discrimination. So it is in favor and is helping especially those um, problematic discrimination cases that are currently not being um, well supported by the court of justice. Um, the question of harm, yes, again, it's a very good question and something that keeps me up at night as well. Um, I think we need to think about new types of harms and new taxonomy of harms, because I think, again, the harms that we have suffered or people have suffered in the past Again, it's based on social lessons, the way that people want to discriminate against people, hold people back, punish people. Those are like very appear, apparent, like immediately, intuitively apparent harms. But especially with the ephemeral nature of, of the internet and technology, that is so much harder to find or detect um, that we actually need to find different ways of contextualizing that. And that has to inform the judiciary at some point that we, the harms are different and therefore we, we need to have a, a new framework around that. Yes, I totally agree. Great, thank you. And, and I think it was so helpful that you addressed that intersectionality question as well, because I think that helps to address um, something asked by Antoine Wallace and a number of others. Um, so uh, I, just building off of that harms piece, there was a question actually diving more deeply into how EU discrimination law applies to the algorithmic supply chain more generally. So for instance, in the example where you're talking about the restaurant listing, the, uh, the job um, or a restaurant listing uh, job contracts with an, with an advertiser and the advertiser buys off an off the shelf algorithm that turns out to be biased, who then bears the responsibility of the burden in ensuring that system is fair? And more broadly, do the challenges of algorithmic transparency necessitate that we rethink who bears that burden, which is I think what you were trying to say with your response on harms. Yeah, um, that is a very important question that I wrote an actual paper on. Um, which I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share afterwards that it's called um, uh, discrimination by um, online behavioral advertisement and discrimination by association. Um, and it's looking exactly at that question 
how are online harms such as bias advertisement, job advertisement, press discrimination covered by current non-discrimination law? And the question, uh, the answer very short is hardly um, and very problematic. And I fully agree one of the um, um, results of the paper was to say without proper transparency, the law will completely fail. Um, and the question of distribution of liability is completely um, is not has not been quite decided yet. Um, but yeah, that's that's a whole seventy pages that I, I I I wrote on that that I'm very would love to share and get get notes on that as well because it's such an important question. Great, great. Um, so I know we're coming up on time, so I'm going to ask one last uh, set of questions just that were posed in the Q and A. Um, but I also want to reiterate the apology that I made at the very beginning that there were 400 people who joined this webcast and the questions have been wonderful and amazing. And I'm sorry that we could not get to all of them, but I really hope that folks on this call can and will engage with. Yeah, and if anybody wants to reach out or drop an email or have further conversations with me, I would be delighted to do that. Great. So the final question I was just going to ask is related to um, how do we codify and what do we, what do, we do next? So um, how do you think about attempts like say the Bertelsmann AI ethics label, VCIO, to certify or label AI systems? Are they feasible? Will there be state certifications for AI systems? And I guess a parallel or related question to that is, what are the feasibility of, of some of these principles and ethics and standards uh, processes that have been going on in relation to this, this um, proposal that you make about conditionality? So for instance, a question was asked about what the feasibility of the IEEE standard of ethics are in consideration of AI. So it's more about how, where do we go next with this? How do we think about this? I think it's a great, very different way of thinking about how many others in the field have been addressing this. Yes. Um, so first, I think it's, for me, extremely exciting to see that so many um, different diverse brains are thinking about this problem at the moment. I think the last couple of years have been very, very fruitful in trying to figure out what to do next. And there are interesting strategies out there. Um, I think we're not quite um, there yet. There is um, still room to debate um, uh, because I think we would jump into the solution question too early before we actually, you know, talked about the very important actual question is, you know, what, what is the, what's the, what's the end result? What is the thing that we actually, what, we, what are we marching for? Um, that is the, the fundamental question that we need to answer first. Do I see technology as something that is making things faster and quicker and more efficient and cheaper? Or do I see this as an opportunity to actually empower disempowered communities and make sure that the, um, the, the wealth divide gets narrowed? That's the fundamental question. And that's, you have to decide whether, what's the role of tech in that. And once you have to decide that, then you can think about frameworks and guidelines and laws and all of that that are in service of that compass that leads you. And I think at the moment we don't even have clarity what our compass yet is. Once we have that, and I'm obviously, um, for me, it is there to make the world a better place. It's not just to make things faster and, and, and cheaper. It is to make the world a better place. And then the question is, what does a better place mean and how can we ensure that it's actually being followed? A lot of the attempts that we have like, for example, enforceability. Um, it's very often on, on, based on principles and codes of conduct and ethics and with very little oversight, um, with very little knowledge if people are actually following those guidelines, with very little um, ramifications if they don't. And I think there is um, a lot that we probably need, need to work on. So, yeah, it's a question of what do we want, what, what do we expect of tech and how are we going to make it work? Um, and I think to answer that question, you really need a very wide and broad set of different people to think about that very hard together. That's a wonderful answer. And this has been a really tremendous hour. So I, I thank you so much, Sandra. And thank you to Bao Bao and Jasmine for being our respondents. And thank you all for such thank you so much, wonderful Jim. questions. Thank so you. We appreciate it. And um, thanks so much. And everybody have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye.